the Eurus, Anthalops, Aptaleon, Analopos, medieval perceptions of the antelope including heraldry, as well as a bunch of name variations like Alcida, Antula, Aptalon, Aptalops, Otalops, Otula, Antal, Panthalops, and Talopus. So many creatures, yet so few differences. Well, there I go, beginning this video with the distortion of some facts to support my own narrative. These beasts do share a lot of similarities, and I mean a lot, but the Eurus is quite distinct. The rest are a lot more uniform, but they all need to be discussed collectively. You might be wondering what these unifying features are that connect them all. Well, in this episode I'll be dissecting ungulates with so-toothed horns, noteworthy drinking habits, an ability to fell trees and a tendency to get stuck in foliage. While this sounds odd specific, you have already seen the moderately long list of such creatures. Let's take a look at them one by one. The Eurus is an ox-like beast, featured in European bestiaries. It is described as being the size of a large bull with massive so-toothed horns. It occasionally uses this weapon to cut down trees, although the reason for this is not specified as far as I know. The beast is prone to drink seawater by accident, which disorientates it. As it stumbles around, the Ursus horns can get stuck in the ground or a tree, which makes it an easy prey for hunters. As you can see, this beast ticks all the boxes. As will the rest, although there is an interesting discrepancy with the Eurus itself. It is an ox-like creature. The Orox, a species of wild cattle which has gone extinct in the early 17th century, is also known by the alternative name of Eurus. This ruminant is considered the ancestor of domestic cattle and while its numbers have diminished greatly as a result of human activity, they weren't exactly unknown in the Middle Ages. What's more, some bestiaries do actually write of the Orox with a relative accuracy, noting Eurus as another name. In these accounts, the sawhorns are missing, as is the saltwater drinking kerfuffle. How could these vastly different descriptions coexist? While I have no definitive answer, it is not too difficult to speculate. With the rapidly approaching extinction of the wild animals, fewer and fewer people had first-hand knowledge of the species. Since it was known to inhabit Asia and North Africa as well, most likely some scholars peered into the accounts of the fauna found on those continents in order to fill the knowledge gap. The Eurus was mixed with incorrect but contemporary descriptions of antelopes, with some details changed here and there. This is a likely reason, which may explain why this version did not overshadow more accurate reports, with the Oroch still retaining the Eurus name. The remaining creatures of this list are all, in fact, such 40 entries discussing antelopes. Going chronologically, the first versions originate from Mesopotamia. In Chaldea, people spoke of the Analopus. It lived near the Euphrates, but had a vital flow. Its horns were prone to get entangled in thickets, making it easy to capture. A fancy statue bearing this name was supposedly found in the Chaldean city of Ur during its excavation. Unfortunately, I found no image of it while scouring the internet, so I cannot confirm the so toothed horns, but the next creature might rectify that. The other similar beast of Mesopotamia was part of Babylonian myths. Since the Chaldeans were assimilated into the state, it can be assumed that this is a continuation of the Analopus. This version was called the Eptaleon. It resembled a goat, but with two serrated horns, which were handy tools when it came to felling trees. However, this was a laborious task and raised a great thirst in the Eptalons. They quenched it by the refreshing waters of the Euphrates. These animals were also known to occasionally wander into the desert. If it stumbled onto an Arakair bush, don't ask me which plan that is, I have no idea, its horns would get tangled up, making escape impossible. That's all the boxes take though, right? Now, the similarities in name are not the only reasons these creatures were likely exaggerated tales of antelopes. The Euphrates often saw the congregation of gazelles, which quenched their thirst, most likely not worked up as a result of logging activities, by the river. Species like the Arabian gazelle or the now extinct Saudi gazelle are roughly goat sized with horns that do not have a smooth surface. The small circular protrusions could have been the inspiration for so teeth. Naturally, since no sawhorned animal exists, we have to assume this was the case for all such animals, except for the Eurus, which was just an inaccuracy, as no one who has ever seen an Aurochs in their life would say their horns have spikes. 
As for the antelopes, this is not really a stretch. Even elks and reindeer have been described to possess so tooth horns, so such misidentifications were commonplace throughout history. We still have two more examples to go through though. The next variation is the antelopes, or alternatively spelled without the H, which is supposedly Latin for antelope, but the myriad alternate names are often mentioned in relation to it as well, further indicating the confusion with this animal. Medieval beast theories occasionally cover the beast, but manuscript illustrations were not as common as one would expect. Descriptions also differed, marginally at least. The animal supposedly had the so tooth horns we have heard so much about, but some claim that it was also curved. The serrated edges were naturally employed to cut trees. Their body does not have a unified description though, and depictions are often quite different. However, it usually more or less resembles a deer, which is somewhat consistent with antelopes. Another motive that comes up from time to time is the Euphrates from which they drink, as well as the hearthstein shrub which they get their horns stuck in. Still don't know what that plant is, even with the name change. Some accounts specifically mention that the reason for all this entanglement is the antelopes in a desire to play in the bush, which they cannot resist. Naturally, hunters were set to exploit this flow, and it is often depicted in such a manner. A unique feature of the Middle Ages is that some beast theories often like to moralize animals, usually using them as allegories for religious guidance. The same was true for the antelope. A common idea is that the animal itself is a man of God, trying to lead a virtuous life, devoid of sin. The two horns represent the Old and New Testaments, which can be used to cut away vices, like the animal cuts trees that would block their passage. But the devil, like the Harasine bush, can grab onto them if they would fall into temptation. In another variation, the horns are man's desire to sin, and the thickets represent worldly pleasures. Ugh. I'm sorry, but these moralizing stories are always so uninspired formulae, can just plain old lame, sucks the far right out of any imaginary or real animal. Anyway, while the names did not always match, it is quite clear that beast theories generally spoke of the same creature, although depictions are quite varied, with the sotheeth occasionally being omitted, but this can be attributed to the general misinformation of illustrators. Animals like the sable antelope or oryxes are likely inspirations for these accounts, as well as a few members of the Cervidae family. This latter one I briefly touched upon, and indeed some deer species were similarly misidentified. For instance, following his travels, Gaius Fabricus Luscinus Monoculorum. Gaius Fabricius Luscinus Monocularis confirmed that reindeer have so like antlers, so we can definitely add them as potential influences. There isn't really any explanation for the heraldic antelope though. It has the body of a stag, the tail of a unicorn or a lion, the head of a tiger or a deer, serrated horns and tusks protruding from its nose. Unfortunately, I could not uncover what it stood for, but it was one of the royal badges of Henry IV, so it wasn't too obscure. That's all the distinct variations of the antelope, with the rest being alternate names. These mostly originate from the fact that knowledge of the antelope wasn't widespread in the Middle Ages, and many beast theories or their sources invented new words for it. Well then, we should step over to the verb bench as it is time to create a realistic creature based on the information we know. Now, this video will use the Eurus in the title since we are the letter U, but we already have two bulls. Here's my goal. I aim to theorize an antelope with a serrated horn that is rather beefy and can be called a bovine by those unaware of what it actually is. Not too much of a stretch, both antelopes and cattle belong to the Bovidae family. I was thinking it would be a member of the Hippotragonesa family. The sable antelope already came up as a possible inspiration and oryxes like the Gemspok or Scimitar oryx are akin to what we are looking for. If we create a new genus that is a bit more robust, it is something that can be mistaken for a bull while still being similar enough to a goal to inspire those early tales. What about the horns though? Well, we do have the slight curve sorted, but why would an antelope have a so-toed one? Since these horns possess ridges over most of their length, there is already a foundation to have these spikes, or a serrated edge. But what would be the reason? It could be a devastating weapon against predators, that is certain, but that's not the only thing antelopes use their horns for. If two competing males have spikes on those horns that directly point at each other's skulls, that's going to raise the mortality rate. Naturally, sowing trees is not only unfeasible with such a dull implement, but also pointless, so that's not gonna cut it either. <laughs> 
So what could it be? Well, prepare your psyche, cause this is going to be a wild one. Such an unusual feature requires a very distinct role to play that is also important for the animal. The legends often mention the hearth sign or Arakaya shrub, so that gives us something to work with. Since we are most likely talking about an imaginary or unidentifiable plant, I'm going to take some liberties. In our theoretical world, this bush has an extensive root system which helps it reach the groundwater even during drought. Another adaptation entails tubers which grow along this system, storing nutrients for hard times, while also facilitating asexual reproduction. The ancestors of the Urs, or the antelopes, used their horns to dig around the herbicide bushes, looking for these tubers. Since they were not ideal tools, natural selection favored those with more specialized horns. Along the front of the implement grew larger and larger protrusions. These not only aided in moving soil, but also served as hooks. The roots could tangle up in them, helping the animals pull the tubers out more easily. Alternatively, the pointy ends of these spikes could also directly hit one such prize, proving even more useful for this task. However, these protrusions aren't long and point roughly upwards. This would prevent mortal wounds caused by mere rivalry. One adaptation that has to occur though is a change in the orientation of the horns themselves. If they remain pointing backwards, that makes poking the round rather difficult. Hence, we should move these implements a bit so that they can be more easily used for this purpose. The roots wrapped around their horns could easily produce the legends of how they get stuck in bushes, so this is a valid approach, I think. You might be wondering what is my reasoning behind the teeth only appearing on the front. Well, I say digging would be needlessly difficult with more stuff in the way. A horn with practically a single point is easier to stab into the ground, and since they use the spikes to pull out the tubers, anything that makes such a feat more difficult would not gain prominence. So that is the final look, but we still have a few things to go over. The habitat is uh, not an issue. Most of the Hippotrachinae antelopes live in Africa, with some species like the Arabian oryx found in the Middle East. We could have this animal inhabit the Arabian Peninsula and parts of North Africa in regions where the herbicide supposedly grows. The stories of sowing trees would likely be based on the appearance of the horns, as it was in the real world. As for the notable drinking habits, well, it is likely that the urus or antelopes would most often be encountered by bodies of water, and the connection would be perceived as deeper than it really is. I don't see any of them drinking salt water though. Lastly, What's up with the heraldic version? Well, point me to a heraldic animal that accurately depicts its counterpart. While we created a creature that matches most of the far-fetched and incorrect descriptions of antelopes, this is one I'll not integrate fully. I just don't see the point of task blocking one's nostrils. Otherwise, the actual urus or antelopes could very well have been the basis of such emblems in our hypothetical reality. That's uh, everything addressed, except for the Christian moralizing, but I'm not touching that. I quite like this unique little beast actually, gaining an edge over other antelopes by exploiting a resource they cannot. I hope you also liked this episode, if you did and also fancy talking about monsters, world building or anything of the sort, please come and join my discord channel through the link in the description. Next video will likely tackle another request, but no promises on that one, it all depends on how much information I can gather on a particular version of the creature. Anyway, see you in a couple of weeks, bye!